so welcome back everybody to the dry dock episode 223 part 2 you'll know why you're here so let's get on with the question Jeffrey Connolly asks, In the Second Punic War, if the Carthaginians, a.k.a. Hannibal, instead of fighting Rome in a land war, had decided to do something similar to what Sextus Pompey would do to Augustus and Rome years later by using piracy in a blockade, would this have given Carthage a better chance compared to what happened historically? It's relatively unlikely to have succeeded in any great way, shape or form. The fundamental difference when it comes to why you don't use this kind of strategy in the second punic war as opposed to the first is that in the first punic war you essentially have the romans controlling most of the italian peninsula the carthaginians controlling sort of western north africa and a little bit of iberia and the big battleground is sicily and sicily forces both sides to use fleets to get there and so there's a lot of naval action between the First and the Second Punic Wars, the Carthaginians have expanded their holdings in Iberia to control pretty much most of the Iberian Peninsula, which is now kind of becoming their economic powerhouse and manpower and resource powerhouse in order to fight Rome. Because the thing is, prior to that, most of Carthage's wealth came from just trade at sea. So they were rich but they didn't have vast amounts of actual, you know, physical resources to hand that they didn't buy. And so by expanding into Iberia, this gave them the resources to actually, you know, turn their funds into warships and men and equipment to fight. The flip side to that is that there is now only a few Gaulish tribes on what we would now recognize as the french mediterranean coast standing between the northernmost carthaginian holdings and the northernmost roman holdings which means that whereas before if carthage and rome wanted to fight each other anywhere they had to go by sea now they could go by land and since iberia was kind of carthage's as i said resource breadbasket at this point they really had to defend it and it would would also be cheaper if you had a army of several tens of thousands of men to simply go from point a to point b you know the romans were expecting hannibal to do that they just weren't expecting him to do it exactly when he did it in terms of during the seasons of the year as opposed to you know having to build hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of warships to try and go after rome from carthage itself which would as I said a be incredibly expensive and be far more vulnerable to being sunk by storms or attacked by the romans or whatever the other problem is in if you're going to look at a piracy campaign when you look at a map of the second punic war basically both sides have their core homeland so the north african coast for carthage and the italian peninsula for rome and one additional grouping of secondary holdings so iberia for carthage and a few islands and now Sicily, which the Romans won in the First Punic War, and some of the other Western Mediterranean islands. So they're fairly close-knit at this point, whereas when Sextus Pompey went on his campaigns in the first century AD, by that point Rome was a empire that spanned almost all of the Mediterranean. So a Roman economy in the time of Sextus Pompey was very vulnerable to piracy because a huge amount of this economy was now based on trade throughout the mediterranean whereas if you try to do a pirate piratical regime against the rome of the second punic war then apart from you know direct contact with sicily which they could probably maintain via their fleet everything else could go internally on the italian peninsula and there wasn't anywhere else that was necessary to trade with well, nice to trade with but not necessary so yeah piracy on blockade by the carthaginians against the romans would not really have been that effective a strategy especially considering that rome had proven in the first punic war that they could build very large fleets to counter the carthaginians so yeah uh, now could carthage have helped hannibal more yes they could um both sides had very large fleets that didn't really do all that much but you know there's limits again to what they could do probably the single biggest thing they could have done which might have helped would have been uh, 
to instead of having to dispatch several reinforcement armies over land which tended to get picked off by the Romans they could perhaps have sailed those reinforcement troops to Hannibal directly on the Italian peninsula that probably would have helped quite considerably and also you know Hannibal ostensibly at least as far as we know seems to have lacked siege engines so maybe using the technical and expertise and wealth of Carthage they could have built siege engines in Carthage and then partially dismantled them and shipped them across to him. Richard Sue, I think, asks, both Helena and her sister ship Phoenix, as in her guise as General Belgrano, were sunk by relatively heavy torpedo salvos, and yet both cruisers were light cruisers, which begs my question, would a heavier ship, such as New Orleans, seen at Tassafaronga, or a newer cruiser like Baltimore or Des Moines, survive the same attacks that Phoenix and Helena took? Well, in both cases, the Helena and Phoenix dash General Belgrano were hit by a pair of torpedoes but the locations of those hits are slightly different. Belgrano for the most part appears to have sunk because she was sailing without being in what would be called condition Z or condition zebra. Um, basically she didn't have all her watertight doors sh shut. Um, whereas Helena, as you can see here from this damage control diagram, took a hit to the bow and a hit directly amidships in her machinery spaces, which on cruisers, heavy hits to the machinery spaces, regardless of if they're heavy cruisers or light cruisers, would probably be fatal. It's interesting, however, that you know a lot of US cruisers would have their bows either partially or wholly blown off, and the ship itself would still remain largely intact. In fact, that's one of the hits on General Belgrano, blew her bow off, but the bulkheads held. Um, echoes of Tassafaronga there. But, um, well, a New Orleans is roughly the same displacement as uh, a Brooklyn class anyway. But if you look at the engineering layouts of a Des Moines or a Baltimore, as with most ships, they have their machinery spaces amidships when you talk about World War II era warships. So if you had the torpedo attack that took out Helena, like this, as you can see, if that hit uh, New Orleans, a Baltimore, or a Des Moines, I think the New Orleans and probably the Baltimore would go down because, you know, whatever happens with the bow hit that hit directly amidships on the machinery spaces is really going to cause some major flooding, and cruisers really don't have that much in the way of anti-torpedo defences. A Des Moines would still be in a lot of trouble, but might be somewhat better off, partly because she's so much larger, and partly, thanks to that size, her machinery spaces are quite heavily subdivided. So it's possible a Des Moines might survive the hit that took out um, Helena but uh, I would certainly wouldn't want to be aboard it would be a heck of a struggle now when it comes to General Belgrano her second hit was aft just past the armor belt now you're taking a hit for and aft obviously sank her would sink quite a number of ships but it doesn't expose the massive void spaces that are a ship's machinery spaces to water immediately so in those cases, um, if you're looking at New Orleans, Baltimore and Des Moines, it's certainly a lot more survivable. Um, possibly even a Brooklyn, if it was fully closed up, might have either survived or taken longer to founder. And of course, back in the day, they had um, you know, the portable diesel pumps, etc., etc. So an electrical failure doesn't necessarily stop you pumping out water. I think it would depend on exactly how that aft hit interacted with the various ships propulsion mechanisms uh, because in theory um, New Orleans would be about as vulnerable as a Brooklyn but as I said a Brooklyn could probably survive if it was completely locked up um, and the Baltimore and Des Moines are progressively larger and therefore more capable of survival uh, with the sole caveat that of course a hit aft if any of those heavy cruisers are moving at speed could cause some serious problems with propeller shafts ripping chunks out of the stern of the ship, which would then, you know, probably fatally compromise things, or you get leaks up the propeller shafts and so forth. So it's possible that the hits that killed Belgrano would also kill 
any of the three named heavy cruiser classes, but it's much less likely as compared to the ones that hit Helena. Cat2V asks, where did the Japanese obsession with divided forces come from in the 1920s and 1930s? For a fleet devoted to Mahanian thinking, and whose greatest triumphs in the Russo-Japanese war came from concentration of force, their constant need to divide their own forces, such as the battleships operating way behind the Kidobutai at Midway, or the complete waste of Rougeau later on, makes very little sense. Even in their early triumphs, there were numerous near disasters in the Java Sea campaigns that should have warned them. Well, the problem for the Japanese when it came to Kantai Kessen was that they knew the American fleet was larger than theirs. So, whereas with a concentration of force approach as at Tsushima, they could bring to bear a fleet that was approximately of the same scale as the Russian one, once various you know, qualitative facts are accounted for, and they could try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Russians previous to that as well, at things like Yellow Sea and Port Arthur, they knew they couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the entire American fleet. So a concentration of force in a World War II context against the US Navy was counterproductive. Additionally, you know, even with the Kantai Kessen doctrine itself, which did hold for a large fleet action, even then the fleet was still divided because remember most of the destroyers and cruisers would be off in the darkness ahead of the main battle fleet, causing trouble for, for the American ships, breaking their screens and hopefully sinking or damaging American battleships before falling back to let the reduced American fleet run into the Japanese fleet and then you'd have your big fleet battle. So under their interwar fleet doctrine, the idea of splitting their forces to achieve separate aims that would gradually wear down the opponent fleet was perfectly in line with what they thought they'd need to do. Uh, additionally, you had the fact that once you introduce the carriers, even with cargo being a little slow, the overall speed of the Japanese carrier fleet was significantly in excess of that of most of the Japanese battle fleet, barring the Congos, and you needed that speed for air operations. So, you know, do you tie your faster carriers to much slower battleships, or do you let your carriers roam free and have more operational control over what they're doing? Uh, in a lot of ways, the carriers were kind of being used, not necessarily as a substitute, but in a similar role to how the cruisers and destroyers had been envisioned in most of the interwar period. So the carriers were there, supposed, and they were supposed to suppress Midway, deal with any local U.S. ships, etc., and then the battle fleet with the sort of the final decision maker, in this case the tr troop transports, would come through. So. Yeah, it, it's not quite as mad as might it might appear. There is a logic to why they did these things and why they were avoiding trying to concentrate and have a full-on knockdown drag out fight with the US fleet early on before they'd reduced its strength enough to make that worthwhile. And there's also the thought that, of course, multiple forces in different places can achieve multiple different objectives and then recoalesce. It's you know, did just unfortunate for the Japanese that they ended up fighting a force that could pick off a lot of these individual forces relatively quickly. And to a certain extent, the fact that there were near disasters but hadn't turned into disasters during the Java Sea campaigns had kind of reinforced to the Japanese, I think, this idea that you could do lots of these independent operations and then pull back. So when they're still doing lots of these independent operations, and then those independent bits get hit really hard as the Allied war effort develops past early 1942. Well, it comes as a bit of a surprise, but by the time it's happened, it's happened, and there's precious little you can do to regain those vessels. Fred the Red asks, How did the Admiralty keep track of its ships during the latter age of sail, for example during the Napoleonic Wars? Was it simply a guessing game and hoping that the captains reported in? And how did they make sure orders actually got to the ships with some level of security? It was a rather complex system. So they would give ships orders to operate within certain areas, or it was maybe specifically to blockade certain ports, but it was a somewhat deregulated system of command in that the Admiralty had the overall objectives, but then they would entrust the fulfilment of those objectives in more detail to the admirals in charge of the various stations. 
and those stations would usually have some kind of home port so that the Admiralty back in London could send semi-regular messages to there and hopefully at some point from there it would reach out to wherever the station commander was if he wasn't in the port and he could then disseminate any changed orders to ships in the area. Now, you know, the overall objectives could be very broad, you know, disrupt enemy shipping in your area or something like that. Or they could be very specific, capture this town, stop this particular ship, etc., etc. Um, and so the Admiralty knew that it had sent X number of ships into that area. And as ships entered um, and left, that would also help update the Admiralty. So if they'd sent, I don't know, half a dozen ships to the line and a dozen frigates to operate on a certain station, then maybe one of those ships of the line would need to come back for a refit. It could then bring the latest information as far as it knew about what was going on there and which ships were where and what conditions they were in. And a ship of a new third rate, let's say, that was coming out to replace it could bring updated information from the Admiralty. Then you had uh, an additional system, which were variously called picket boats, packet boats, schooners, What it, basically, as you can see in the picture, these very small but still armed and commissioned warships, and they would run messages and various low-volume, high-value goods to and from the various areas. So HMS Pickle, for example, um, which was a, a little 10-gun schooner, was the ship that took the messages back from Trafalgar to England. And there was another similar vessel that took order, took messages and information from Nelson back to England when he was chasing Villeneuve back across the Atlantic in the run-up to the Battle of Trafalgar. And so specific orders that needed to be moved securely or specific information could go via either these small ships, which are usually very fast and fairly hard to spot, or they could go with reinforcement ships or reinforcement formations, uh, either way, and they would then obviously make their way to the various stations. So it was not the world's most precise system, but it physically couldn't be because there wasn't even anything like a telegraph system available the admiralty back at home would receive messages sometimes months old and so that this was why they had to set fairly broad objectives about what they wanted done and trust the admirals and commodores on station to fulfill those orders as best they could because obviously they had a much shorter communications loop and if there was something very very specific that needed to be sent then off it would go in one of these ships and that's how you get things like say the battle of new orleans being fought after technically the war of 1812 was over because the message didn't reach either side that the war was over for several weeks after said war was actually over joel mullen asks how did events unfold in the action that led to the sinking of ub-68 by hms snapdragon and the capture of carl dernitz well, you had a UB-68, which was a UB-3-class U-boat under the command of Carl Dernitz, and he was attack trying to attack a convoy. Um, he'd been doing relatively well for himself, but then, whilst he was attacking the convoy, the submarine developed some kind of technical problem, which forced it to surface, at which point it was promptly set upon by the convoy's escorts. And some sources just say gunfire other sources name as you did a snapdragon other sources add in a second ship uh, because a snapdragon of course is was a royal navy warship um, other sources add in a trawler the cradosin which was also a uh, at that point in naval service where a snapdragon was a sloop and then one or two more other sources at a third vessel, which may have taken a few pot shots at UB-68, um, a steamer that was part of the convoy uh, called Queensland. But regardless, UB-68 surfaced near a convoy it was trying to attack and was promptly sunk by gunfire, albeit that the vast majority of the crew survived. Again, sources disagree whether one, three or four people of the crew survived, but since the crew was in the high 30s, the majority of them were obviously survivors, including Dönitz, who was taken prisoner and would only wind back up in Germany a couple of years after the war ended. 
Although, of course, there are one or two less reliable sources um, which claim that UB68 was okay. Yes, it was forced to the surface by um, technical issues, but then it was scuttled. Because, you know, no German ship has ever been sunk, apparently, according to some of these some of these uh, less reliable people. Did you know every single Imperial German and Kriegsmarine warship? No, 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 they, they were never sunk. They were mildly inconvenienced by the Allies, at which point, to preserve their great technological superiority, they were scuttled to keep their secrets from the enemy. You know, never mind the fact that quite how they'd managed to end up so inconvenienced by the Allies if they were so technologically superior is never quite fully explained, but there you go. Sorry, a little bit of a side rant there, but it just does irritate me when you, you know, when you look into almost any German warship that was sunk in World War One or World War Two, you'll usually some find some crank or wackaloon who's tried to decide uh, that to the and to tell the world that it was actually scuttled by its crew. Uh, you know, yes, Scapa Flow was a scuttling. UB sixty eight was not. <laughs> Next thing you know, someone will be trying to convince me that the Pomern was actually scuttled by her crew to prevent the torpedo from claiming the honor. Orcage asks, where would Yamato's 18-inch gun outside the Yamato Museum hit if it was fired. Now, I think this is actually a 16-inch gun from Mutsu, um, not an 18-inch gun from Yamato, and very inconveniently, they put it behind a wall. Nonetheless, there's enough of the gun to actually work out approximate elevation. And, well, it seems to be mounted at a very shallow angle. Uh, my online measurement tools, which I used with the other uh, gun measurements that we've done previously, indicates about three or four degrees, which would indicate the shell's probably going seven and a half, no, probably close to 8,000 yards, I think. So let's find out what's 8,000 yards down the road. And, well, the answer is at this low angle, actually, the first thing that's going to happen is going to tear through a bunch of buildings and then slam into a mountain that's about a kilometre or two east. But if we you know, magically hand wave all the various obstacles, including you know, the small mountain that would get in the way, and we just go, OK, well, magically everything is flat up to the point that it would land, then the shell is either going to land on or just short of a rather surprised small wharf uh, or quay that's got a bunch of small boats on it in the uh, southeastern part of Kure. From Google Street View it appears to be a very small industrial estate connected to this wharf with a bunch of small private boats somewhere on what appears to be called Route Hiro Nigata Te Shajo or Shajo, I don't know, something along those lines. Sorry, I don't, I'm not very good at reading Japanese, but anyway. That, that's roughly where the shell would land, assuming you know, two mountains don't stop it. Elliot W. James asks, I recently rewatched the Battle of River Plate 1956 movie featuring a number of World War II ships. Both Sheffield and Jamaica feature, and the ships armed with the 50 caliber 6-inch Mark 23. The central gun of the triple turret seems to be mounted about a metre deeper into the turret. Where? Why is this? Well, this feature survives in HMS Belfast, which you can see here, has exactly the same thing with its gun turrets. Now, this was done for a couple of reasons. One, by setting back the gun internally, it made the loading and re reloading of the gun somewhat easier because it offset the gun crews. But also by setting back the gun, it was hoped that it would prevent interference between the various muzzle blasts from causing disruption to the ship's gunnery accuracy because if they're all level together uh, they found that actually they you would get interference and thus the salvos became less and less accurate as it turned out it was only partially successful and there were delay coils involved as well by the time the ships actually went into service but uh, yeah that's basically it makes reloading easier and it means that you can also have a more accurate turret whilst having the guns relatively packed in close together Weyland Chow asks, if Imperial Germany from 1898 to the start of World War I implemented its own two-power standard based on the combined strength of the French and Russian navies instead of implementing the five naval laws, how would this have affected the build-up of the German Imperial Navy 
and the Anglo-German naval arms race. Well, for the sake of simplicity, if we go with ships laid down from 1898 onwards and ignore the ones that were already on the stocks at that point, I think it becomes a little bit of a game of two halves because not counting the Dantons, because they're pretty much built during the Dreadnought period, but from 1898 otherwise forward to the time of Dreadnought, between Russia and France, they build 20 pre-Dreadnoughts. And historically, the Germans laid down 18. So that would be an increase of two pre-Dreadnoughts versus their historical building rate. And the British uh, historically ended up with 27, um, including the Swiftshires, which they ended up having to just buy in. So, you know, overall, you know, a change in two ships, probably not a massive headache for the Royal Navy. They might bump up, you know, various classes by one or two. Um, maybe, you know, maybe the Duncans will be an eight class uh eight ship class as opposed to a six ship class something like that now the interesting part comes when you're looking at dreadnoughts because if you go from the laying down of dreadnought through to the start of the first world war between them the russians and the french lay down 14 dreadnoughts plus you've also got the six dantons coming in as kind of a semi afterthought and for the Germans, well, they lay down historically 19 or 20 battleships, uh, depending if you count Saxon. And they also lay down seven battle cruisers. So, whereas obviously the French and the Russians don't lay down any. So, whilst they build, the Germans, if they're building to two power standard against France and Russia, would build slightly more pre dreadnoughts, they'd actually build slightly less dreadnoughts. Um, and by and large, they'd actually, um, well, if you're broadly going to equiv equivalent the Dantons with the battle cruisers, they're actually going to lay them down somewhat later because the Corbets and the Ganguts were laid down, you know, several years after Dreadnought was. But, you know, broadly speaking, you would end up with minus one battle cruiser. So basically, Hindenburg doesn't get laid down. And you'd end up essentially you wouldn't have Bayern and Baden or maybe you would and maybe you just maybe you probably wouldn't have the Nassau's maybe um, and then one or two other ships somewhere so maybe the Kaisers and Koenigs get cut down a little bit from their historical class sizes so the German fleet at that point uh, at least dreadnought wise would be about 25 to 30 percent weaker than it was historically which would make it cheaper. Um, of course, the Anglo-German naval arms race was predicated on the British exceeding the Germans. But um, the slightly odd thing is, of course, that partway through, the British unofficially went over to 60% greater than Germany because the two-power standard that they had was uh, becoming unaffordable. Whereas in this case, if the German fleet is slightly smaller, there's probably still going to be an arms race. And I suspect the British arms race would probably look about the same it will take a couple of years worth of construction because it's now within their capability to build roughly the same numbers and types of ships but stick to their two power standard sui 420 den asks this might be a bit of blasphemy but how economically viable are large museum ships like uss texas rms queen mary ss united states and the essex class in the future the ships are so large and there's so much steel that can rust and surfaces that need to be painted maintenance costs will keep adding up and eventually it starts to get difficult like in the case of queen mary or texas then there are maintenance problems that will start compounding and events where there are funds for major and even in the event where there's a funds for major overhaul it's hard to get hold of a massive spare dry dock to fit a large ship especially if it has become non-seaworthy in the interim what do you do when tourism revenue doesn't cover your expenses a lot of it depends on the nature of the country that you're in, but also, on, well, I suppose it also, yeah, it's twofold, the nature of the country you're in. One is the, the political side of things. How many grants from state or local or national government can you get to help keep your ship afloat? And also, as I mentioned to a few people while I was in the States, the size of the country. 
Because as I pointed out to a number of people while I was in the States, there's no way the UK could support eight museum battleships. Um, like Economically, theoretically, the money is there. Um, but in terms of raising revenue via visitor attractions, it's just too small a country. If you have, let's say, if we'd kept, I don't know, Vanguard and we stuck her in Portsmouth, then for most of the UK, that's basically, that's the battleship you'd go to see. If we'd kept a King George V and stuck it in, I don't know, Cardiff or um, somewhere on the English East Coast or maybe down in Plymouth, one or the other would end up having to go to the scrapyard because one of them wouldn't get many visitors and in fact you probably end up with both of them going to the scrapyard because the visitors would be somewhat split but not entirely i think um i think unless maybe you had a battleship in london instead of or alongside belfast one in this on the south in portsmouth and one up somewhere in scotland maybe in glasgow or edinburgh outside of that I think the UK is basically, if we had museum battleships, we're basically a two battleship, maybe if you're lucky, a three battleship country. Um, and they definitely couldn't all be of the same class. So we couldn't have kept, say, three King George V because people would just go, well, we've been to one. Why do we need to go to the others? And there's not enough population total to provide the visitors for more than that. Whereas in the US, you've got two South Dakotas and four, all four Iowas, but they're spaced out enough that, and because the country is so large, that if, let's say, you live on the West Coast, chances are if you want to go and see a battleship, you're going to go down and see Iowa. Because, you know, there are going to be countries that are closer to you, <laughs> foreign countries closer to you than, than Missouri or Wisconsin or New Jersey are. And similarly, if you're on the south coast, then you're probably, at least while she was open to the public, going to see Texas or Alabama. And if you're on the east coast, well, then you've got an embarrassment of riches because you have North Carolina, Massachusetts, Wisconsin and New Jersey. But then the, a good chunk of the US population is on the east coast as well. So population density per ship is still probably roughly equal. And the same thing with carriers. There's no way the the UK could support as many museum carriers as the US has, and especially again, not a, if they're of the same class. We could maybe support one, but you can have Lexington, Intrepid, Hornet, Yorktown, and Midway, again because they're approximately speaking all spaced out, and different people in different areas will go to their particular one and if they really like they will go and visit multiple different carriers but again the sheer distance involved and I think that's what it comes down to in terms of economic viability how many people are within if you like your catchment area that aren't being competed for by other identical or similar attractions so the Essex class being scattered around just about viable Texas, um, again, because it comes down to visitor numbers, as I'm sure the Battleship Texas Foundation themselves will tell you, was in a really nice place visually and an absolutely terrible place in terms of actually getting people to come and see them, uh, which is you know going to in part dictate where they go after the dry docking is complete. The ocean liners, I think, are a bit of an example of what happens when you don't have the pulling power. Because, for better or worse, warships, especially warships that have seen action, will draw a lot of attention and a lot of visitors. Whereas the enthusiast crowd for an ocean liner is somewhat smaller. And that's why I think a lot of the ocean liner museum ships have these kinds of funding issues. And this was also a big topic at the HNSA conference earlier this year. You know, where does preventative maintenance save money? You know, it might be ex somewhat expensive up front, but if you can find $2 million to do repairs now, that's probably going to save $30 million in repairs four or five years down the line. But I think to address the, the broader point, 
I think the bigger museum ships definitely are viable, but they have to be fairly well publicised in places that are relatively accessible to the public. You can't have an oversaturation of a particular type for what I term the catchment zone, i.e. you have to identify, roughly speaking, what percentage of a given population are going to visit your ship on any given year. Then that will tell you how much money you're likely to get, and if that money is enough to keep you going, which hopefully it will be, then you have to work out, okay, what could possibly be a competitor for me? What could draw those people off, or what can I do to attract more people? Um, and that brings in a whole numbers game. And this is why, sad as it might seem, there's only a limited number of ships that you can save to become museum ships. Much as we'd like to save a lot of them, the fact is, the more and more there are, the less and less visitors any one individual ship is going to get because everyone's going to be spread out visiting lots of different ships. There's only so much money that people can spend. And then all of a sudden, all the ships have a shortfall. Runon asks, At their current range, could any of USS Olympia's guns penetrate USS New Jersey's belt? And if not, are there any guns contemporary with the Olympia that could? Well, obviously the big 8 inches on Olympia at the moment are stand-ins, but let's assume for a moment that they were the originals. No, they can't penetrate New Jersey's belt, believe it or not, even though they're a couple of hundred yards away across the river. Uh, whilst zero distance penetration figures for Olympia's guns in particular aren't available, um, there are zero distance penetration figures available for the slightly more powerful 8 inch 45 caliber that succeeded this gun. And at zero distance, their penetration is exactly 12 inches. However, that's 12 inches of armor circa 1890s, 1900s, not Iowa's sort of final generation US armor. And of obviously also Iowa, well, an Iowa class um, like New Jersey has an inclined 12 inch belt plus that outer STS plate, which will diminish the power of the shell a little bit. So yeah, if the slightly more powerful gun can, can't do it, then none of Olympia's guns can. However, the 13 inch guns present on the Indiana and Kearsarge classes probably can, just about. Uh, they're contemporary with Olympia's. The 12 inch 35s found on uh, the first Battleship Texas, the 1895 variant, I think maybe might struggle, possibly. There's not really a lot of data available for them. Um, the 12 inch 40s, which would be found on the main class, could, but the main class is significantly newer than the Olympias. So, yeah, there are one or two guns, but we're talking about of Olympia's period that could get through New Jersey across the river, but yeah, it would be close, and we're talking about, you know, full-scale battleship guns at point blank. Fluffy Goat asks, I'm watching your latest video on Nelson, and it got me thinking, who was the first admiral in the Royal Navy to have a ship named after him, and what did he do to earn that honour? I think, depending on how technical you want to be, there are possibly three answers. The oldest being the Ark Royal, uh, not because... The Ark Royal was named after the royal family and they were admirals, but because when she was originally built, she was the Ark Rally, because she'd originally been built by Sir Walter Raleigh. And Raleigh, of course, m mostly a privateer, but also occasionally a commander of the Royal Naval Forces. So if you count Raleigh as a Royal Navy Admiral, then as originally built, Ark Rally, before she was changed to Ark Royal, would be the first ship named after an English admiral on the grounds that he built her, so he got to name her. Um, then the next one would be the 1653 HMS Drake that I can find, which would obviously be named after Sir Francis Drake for all of his accomplishments, albeit that uh, there are a number of Royal Navy ships with Drake in their name, either singular or as part of a name, and it is sometimes a little bit unclear as to whether they're being named after Sir Francis Drake or Drake as in the, you know, the dragon type. So that one's a possibility. And then, of course, you've also got, do you consider uh, Drake to have been an admiral in the Royal Navy? Uh, 
And then the last one is only a few years later, I think 1659. And this one definitely was an admiral in the Royal Navy, and that would be HMS Monk, named after George Monk, a.k.a. the Duke of Albemere, who served in the Commonwealth Navy and then in the Restoration Navy. And she was actually named while Admiral Monk was actually in service with the Navy, actually during the Commonwealth period. So, and obviously named for the service that he gave to the Navy in its fight with mostly the Dutch at that point. Although, interestingly enough, even though we've had plenty of Ansons and Howes and St. Vincents and Nelsons and so forth afterwards, Monk only ever got that ship named after him. Um, there was never again a seagoing HMS Monk, although there was a variety of HMS Albemarle's, to be fair. Andrew Waite asks... In hindsight, would the Nelsons have been better ships if they'd been armed with nine breech-loading 15-inch Mark I naval guns in three turrets? And would the smaller calibre have been offset by commonality of ammunition with the 15-inch armed battleships and the lower muzzle velocity and barrel wear of the 15-inch gun? It's an interesting proposition. I mean, what you're basically describing is F3 except not a battle cruiser. So a battleship version of F3, or as you, know, as you said, kind of Nelson, but with triple 15s instead of triple 16s. Now, that would save weight in a number of aspects. I mean, the gun barrels would be shorter. So theoretically, assuming there were no other problems, you could move the main arm a little bit close together, which would make the belt a little bit shorter. So you'd not only be saving weight on the guns themselves, which a 100 tons or so, uh, but you'd also be saving weight on the ammunition because the individual shells would weigh less. Uh, the hoists would have to be slightly smaller, so they'd weigh slightly less. And as I said, the belt would be just a fraction shorter, so it would weigh slightly less. Um, so even if you kept the turrets at the same overall weight in terms of armour, and the same with the barbettes and everything, you could probably shave a few hundred tons and a little bit of volume off of the ship. Or alternatively, you could expand the machinery spaces just a little bit, maybe put a little bit more machinery down. I mean, it's going to be a relatively marginal saving overall, um, but you could either possibly make the ships a little bit faster, maybe aim to get them up to something approaching Queen Elizabeth speed, so they have a commonality of speed with Queen Elizabeth. That would be an interesting manoeuvre. Um, or just you know redress some of the other savings that had been made that maybe went a little bit too far in terms of the overall structure of the design to keep it under the treaty limits. Uh, so I don't think a huge amount would change with the overall Nelson class itself, except, as you mentioned, there's a commonality of shells. There would be some, you know, politics back and forth over the fact that the Royal Navy is the only sh the only um, navy that doesn't have 16-inch guns. Um, and although the flip side of that is that with lots of commonality in place and so forth, you might see the Royal Navy pressing for a 15-inch cap instead of a 14-inch cap at the Second London Naval Treaty, which probably means the King George V in the 1930s will have triple 15s of the new variety which would be interesting because they, in theory, could use the shells of the old 15-inch guns as well. And as we saw with the Barden trials, it would seem that the 15-inch gun is not lacking in punch when it comes to uh, actually blowing through enemy armour, which, you know, so that they're not going to be substantially less powerful in the battle line. The other interesting thing, of course, is that the Nelson's turrets could elevate up to 40 degrees. So the range issues that led to the introduction of superchargers in some Royal Navy ships in the Second World War wouldn't really apply to them. Um, they could range out quite happily um, as far as is necessary, but that in and of itself might provide a little bit more impetus for similar elevation upgrades to be done because you have uh, proof already if you didn't have that already with one or two other ships on with 15-inch guns. Um, so yeah, I, I certainly don't think it would have hurt all that much, and it might have helped with some issues. And, you know, the the one time they really got to use those guns in anger against, obviously, the uh, Bismarck, well, I don't think the effect's going to be all that much different. Pendon Harley asks, The US Naval Act of 1938 provided for the construction of two carriers. Friedman's US Aircraft Carriers notes that the relatively old Yorktown design was chosen for Hornet, 
due to the estimate that no new carrier design would be ready for about 15 months. Hornet was laid down in September 1939, whereas Essex, the second carrier authorised by the 1938 Act, was not laid down until April 1941. Was the delay in building CV-9 only due to the desire to update the design? Would there have been resources, available slipways, industrial capacity, etc., to build and commission CV-9 as another repeat Yorktown in roughly the same time frame as Hornet? And would the US Navy have been better off having an additional Yorktown ready in 1942, even if it meant that the new design carrier didn't enter service until, until CV-10 was completed? So there's a fair few things involved there. Um, most of the delay between the laying down of CV-8 and the laying down of CV-9 was pretty much due to trying to decide what CV-9 was going to be, because they had some outline designs of a much bigger carrier than the Yorktowns, but they were just that, outline designs. They weren't off-the-shelf ready to go, and you know, even if they had an off-the-shelf ready to go plan, that wasn't necessarily the ship that they were going to build, or that they wanted to build, now you know a plan especially in the 1930s a plan for a ship that sat on a shelf for two or three years is probably not precisely what you want to go forward with so yeah i mean you can look at some of the design studies there were design studies in 1939 there were design studies in 1940 and indeed the sort of final outline general plan for cv9 is actually backdated um, having been drawn after the contracts for CV-9 were issued. So that tells you some idea of the work that was going on in the background to, to you know, decide what CV-9 was going to look like and then, you know, actually get that down in detail. In terms of would resources have been available in terms of slipways industrial capacity to build CV-9 as another Hornet instead, if they'd just gone, you know, basically Hornet and Hornet 2? yes there was plenty of, of slipway space. I mean, just look at how many Essexes were being built a year or, well, a year or two down the line. I mean, there were a ton of them on the slipways at the time that war was declared. So yeah, there would have been space to build a second um, Hornet sub subtype of the Yorktowns if that's what they'd chosen to go with. Um, now, would the US have been better off having an additional Yorktown in 42 as opposed to waiting for Essex in... 43 i mean possibly uh, it's it's entirely arguable i mean hornet was available for essentially not coral sea itself but she was available for the timeline of coral sea because obviously she was off with enterprise doing the do little raid even if she was a little bit fresh at that point so yeah i mean assuming that something doesn't happen to her because you never know but assuming something didn't happen to her then this theoretical yorktown subtype Essex, USS Essex, would either have been available as a third carrier for the Doolittle raid, which I'm relatively unlikely, or more likely, as a third carrier to accompany Yorktown and Lexington to Coral Sea, where obviously she adds another carrier's worth of air aircraft, which in turn might, you know, help Coral Sea be a, an even more decisive victory for the US. Albeit, if the Japanese know that the Americans have another Yorktown type in the service, they might boost the numbers of carriers that they send down with the Coral Sea expedition. So who knows? Midway, obviously, you have Yorktown, Hornet and Enterprise all there. Um, of course, the flip side is if you've got Essex available as well, do they make such a rush to patch up Yorktown? So would you instead have Essex Enterprise and Hornet out there, or would they hatch up anyway and get four carriers out for Midway? Who knows, either way. Um, and then, of course, at Guadalcanal, they, you know, when they're gradually losing carriers as Wasp is torpedoed and sunk, um, Saratoga is damaged, and then Enterprise is damaged, and Hornet is lost, obviously, having an extra flight deck in the form of an Essex definitely would be of help. So I suppose you can make the argument, given just how many Essex class were coming down the line anyway, that having CV-9 as another Hornet might well have actually been a lot more beneficial for US forces in the early part of the war. Michael Gilson asks, the Italians seem to achieve some success with their 600 ton torpedo boats. Of course, they did cheat and the torpedo boats were a bit bigger than 600 tons, but yeah, everyone cheats. 
Leaving aside where the resources and money would come from, would establishing a similar fleet as a Philippine Coast Guard contribute anything to the defence of the Philippines other than more targets for the Imperial Japanese Navy? Given that the vast majority of US forces in the Philippines were caught on the ground or against the quayside as applicable by air attack, and these ships, even if they are a little bit over 600 tonnes, are not exactly the world's most durable. I suspect that the vast majority of them probably would either have been damaged or sunk in port right at the beginning of the campaign, or, like some of the submarines, engaged in ferrying people and vital bits and pieces further south and then eventually away from the Philippines, and maybe a few would have seen combat. Now, at their size, even the older Japanese destroyers, for the most part, would be able to handle them. So I think, given that the Japanese also have a distinct night fighting advantage at the time, they probably would have be just been, you know, hit and sunk repeatedly. But if there were a fair number of them, maybe two, three dozen or so, you know, statistically, probably one of them or one or two of them are going to get some decent hits in. Um, now, granted, of course, their primary offensive weapon is the torpedo, which in 1942, if you're the US Navy, is not something that's ever going to fill you with a huge amount of confidence. But they, they might, they, the surface torpedoes were a little more reliable than the um, sub-launched ones. So maybe they... Yeah, they could have. They probably would have pulled off something. I mean, you sunk a few Japanese ships, but overall, overall, probably something like that isn't going to contribute massively to the defense of the Philippines. I think. Video Dude Twenty Six asks: Given the extensive modernization that many American ships received during World War Two, was there ever any thought to ripping off the old six-inch guns on the Omaha's and giving them an updated armament with, say, four th five-inch thirty-eight twin mounts super firing? And if not, why not? There was some initial thought given to an AA conversion of the Omaha's, kind of what, like what the Royal Navy had done with some of its C-class. However, as you can probably see from this, it runs into a fundamental problem with the design of the Omaha's in the first place. Um, plus, funnily enough, the twin 5-inch 38 mount, which would be the natural go-to, actually weighs more than the twin 6-inch mounts that were on the Omaha's already, um, basically down to the additional mechanisms that were needed to make it dual purpose. But nonetheless, the other big problem was that, as you can tell, the vast majority of the Omaha's guns were encasements, and you ain't getting encasement anti-aircraft guns. So... If you were going to do, as you suggest, maybe four twin 5-inch 38s, well, you'd have to sacrifice a fair bit to get that. Definitely drop the torpedo launchers. That's not a huge loss. Um, drop the aircraft handling facilities on the back. Again, not a necessarily huge loss, as long as you've got enough radar, etc. You're probably going to have to beef up the masts to and the superstructure to get you the fire control directors and so forth that you need at the higher levels. But as you can see, down the middle of the ship, there really isn't a lot of space. Um, you could maybe put 20s and 20 mil or 40 mil either side of the funnels, and you could probably make quite a nice nest of 40 mil in place of the, an of the aircraft handling facilities there on the back. Um, but you'd have to completely rework the forward superstructure. You'd basically have to not just remove the casement guns, but both for the forward and aft superstructures where those guns are mounted, you'd effectively have to cut it down to deck level, to the upper deck level, and rebuild it as a support structure for the 5-inch 30S. Now, that might save you enough weight to actually, you know, once you've taken out all the casement guns and the twin sixes, etc., to actually have your four 5-inch 38s plus, um, you know, uh, all your various 40s and 20s etc however that would be an awful lot of expense to go through in order to get a ship that had a long-range heavy anti-aircraft battery that's only actually well with eight guns it's three guns better than a fletcher two guns better than a gearing um and that okay they're 
secondary AA, the 20s and 40s, will be present in a lot greater numbers. The cruiser theoretically have a longer range and so forth. Um, but it would be an, a, lot of, a, a lot of money for actually not a huge amount of return because alternatively, I suspect that the price of converting, the price and time for converting an Omaha into this anti-aircraft variant probably would be be more than just building a couple of Fletchers, which would then have more guns um, and, you know, are two hulls. So if it takes a bad kamikaze hit, you only lose half. And that's fundamentally the problem. The The one that they were looking at actually was looking at a bunch of single mounts, but again, without significant revision to the layout of the ship because of those casements, there's not actually not a huge amount of space on the OMRs where you can get a decent arc of fire. You know, you could replace the twin sixes fore and aft with single five inch thirty eights. Fine, you get a decent arc of fire off of those. But then, well, you could maybe get another five inch thirty eight fore and aft. So you get four five single five inch thirty eights, and then all the casement structure, pretty much similar to how I said before, would have to be reworked. So maybe you could get six in triple stacks fore and aft. Um, and then maybe one replacing each of the aircraft catapults, but then you're still to only back up to eight guns, <laughs> so it's not really helped all that much. Edward Olson asks, what role did Nemesis and her sisters ordered by the Secret Committee play in the development of the British Ironclad? I know she did well in the First Opium War, but what lessons were learned about iron ships? Amusingly enough, actually, Nemesis almost torpedoed the idea of a British Ironclad before Britain never considered building ironclads, specifically because she did so well in the Opium Wars, bearing in mind that Nemesis was not an ironclad vessel, she was simply an iron-hulled vessel. She didn't have any real armour to speak of compared to the ironclads of the 1860s. But because of her incredible resilience and capabilities against, admittedly, not exactly the world's strongest opposition, even if they were numerous, it started a temporary craze amongst various navies, including obviously the British, to try and build iron ships. And the theory went thus. Um, what had been observed with Nemesis was that her iron hull, which, you know, was a fairly substantial iron plates, was able to completely, you know, no-sell a bunch of smaller shot, which was good. Um, and when, a, in testing, when a... Um, shot went through iron hull plating it tended to just punch a hole a small hole about the size of the shot and then it would presumably go off through the other side now this was considerably better believe it or not than wooden ships because wooden ships as we've mentioned before would generate a ton of splinters when you smash through the hull and the thickness of the wood that they were building into wooden ships meant that actually you could build an iron hull, which would be stronger and lighter than a wooden hull. So it seemed, all of a sudden, that um, this iron ship was a miracle solution because, you know, as I said, it, it would stop smaller shot, grape shot, canister, etc. And where it didn't, the damage to the ship and the damage to the people inside would be considerably less. And so a whole slew of iron hulled warships hit the water, and then they promptly found in service that it was actually awful. Um, if when they did testing that in with the ships in service, they discovered that apart from a variety of building issues, which are to be expected because it was all fairly new, they discovered that heavy shot would actually smash the iron plates like glass. So you'd have you know massive ragged holes punched in the ship, and now heated shards of very sharp iron splinters blowing through the ship which was even worse than the wooden ones so everyone was very confused and those iron hull ships were very re quickly relegated from being frontline ships to being things like troop ships and supply ships and everyone gave up on the idea of iron for serious warships for a good long while until the french came along with gloire and well there's floating batteries in the crimean war and so forth and the reason for this as it turns out was metallurgy engineering basically the iron that was manufactured for ship hulls and armour in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s had this annoying habit of having going through a transition of uh, its properties 
depending on temperature and i mean most metals do especially iron and steel and so forth but what was essentially happening was that in the warm waters around china and on another lovely summer's day on land the iron that was being shot at was above this phase transition point at which point it was fairly ductile hence the you know small punched hole the problem was if you then stuck it in cold water like say the north sea or the atlantic it the temperature of the iron dropped below that transition point and now all of a sudden it, it was very brittle and hence you got the almost glass like smashing of it and well that was a big problem so yeah ironically enough because they didn't quite understand the metallurgy of the iron they were using nemesis ended up basically putting a hold on the development of iron warships for about a decade and a bit and then of course well with advances in um the what composition of the iron that they were making for ships and the fact it was now being put in armor with a lot of backing etc 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 then you got ironclads in the 1860s which is about 20 years after nemesis Paislitz asks hydrac which one of your videos so far makes you feel proud the most? Which one has surprised you the most in terms of its success? And which topic that comes up repeatedly irritates you the most? So I'm going to answer them a little bit out of order. So which videos have surprised me the most in terms of their success? I would probably say two, uh, which are both actually small series. So the Destroyer Development one, um, has especially the interwar destroyer development has a absolutely huge number of views and people are persistently reminding me i need to get back to that and do the world war ii destroyer development bit to you know round out the series which i am please gradually working on <laughs> it takes a while because the fundamental problem is is that doing the interwar destroyers it's fine like they were developed then this one was developed then this one was developed and there's a somewhat thing of a logical progression. The problem is when you get into the World War II, you have lots of lessons being learned from wartime, which has a whole other complexity layer to it. Plus, everyone has different ways of building destroyers so everything goes all over the place you've got the americans who are just like well we were building the fletchers and just hold down print on the fletcher run and then later on you get the sumners and the gearings which are slightly bigger but then you get the british who have gone kind of big with the tribals then drop down a bit and it, they vacillate a little bit with the jkl m's and n's and then you get the wartime emergency flotillas which are considerably smaller but gradually ramp back up in size again um the germans basically don't really have much of a destroyer program for most of the war the japanese who are on the verge of splitting their destroyers into three types and end up just churning out whatever they can get their hands on etc etc it's just a really complex field but i was surprised that see how far up the rankings that one the other one i think that really surprised me was the pearl harbor salvage series now granted it's to do with Pearl Harbor. I shouldn't necessarily be too surprised that it got popular. But the fact is the salvage efforts of Pearl Harbor, the reason I did that series was because in most literature and stuff, the Pearl, the salvage efforts don't really get that much attention. I mean, you know, you could fill a library with the books that have been written about the attack on Pearl Harbor. I think you could probably fill half a shelf, if that, with the books that have been written about the salvage of Pearl Harbor. And I've got most of them. <laughs> um, so I, I did it, that series, mostly because it appealed to me from an engineering perspective. You know, the intricacies of how they salvaged the ships. I thought it might be, it might get, a, I was thinking to myself basically, well, s salvage work as a whole probably isn't as much of interest and maybe the effect that it's related to Pearl Harbor will maybe boost up to kind of fairly normal levels of engagement. But apparently everybody loves it. Um, so who knew? Um, in terms of which of your videos makes you feel proud the most? See, that's a difficult one because I feel proud of certain videos for different reasons. I can feel proud of... 
some videos because of the work I put into them, even if they're not necessarily that popular. I can put have pride in some videos where I put a lot of work into, and they were very popular uh, and still are. Um, I can put pride into other videos because of the guests that I had on. The fact that, you know, I've managed to establish a channel with a reputation that's good enough to have not just, um, you know, guests who really know what they're talking about in their fields, but, you know, a lot of them are happy to return. Um, so, but I think if I had to pick any single video of mine at the moment and say, this is the one that I'm the proudest of, I think it would actually have to be the one on HMAS Armadale, purely because, almost entirely because, I mean, it's it's a good story, but there are plenty of good stories from World War II, but I was incredibly privileged to be granted the um, permission to obviously use the interview footage that, um, that was recorded with uh, the survivor from HMS Armadale and you know there are so few as and I think I've mentioned this before there are so few World War II survivors left now uh, you know 10 15 20 years ago they were almost all over the place but now now that we have platforms like YouTube which allow us to you know get their stories and distribute them to lots of people who might be interested in hearing about them as opposed to selected snippets on TV documentaries or, you know, the hours upon hours upon hours of audio interviews and video interviews that have been done and then filed away in universities and museums and so forth. But it comes about just at a time when most of these guys are slipping away. And it was just, and, and also just there was something about about him as well and I think to be able and of course the other thing was in the time between that interview being done and me starting preparation of the video and the video actually being released um, unfortunately he passed away so yeah I think that of all of them that's the one I would say I'm proudest of because I was able to bring that one that that last voice of Armadale to a much wider audience than perhaps it's otherwise ever going to get um, so yeah, with that said, which topic comes up repeatedly that irritates me the most? Um, believe it or not, it's not Bismarck. It, it genuinely isn't. Um, I'd say actually there, there isn't a, one specific topic that comes up that irritates me the most. Um, but I'd say there is an attitude that does irritate me the most when I see it. Um, I mean, you do get people who are just you know, obnoxious and self-absorbed and they have a they clearly have an agenda they're not actually prepared to listen they're just basically there to rant but you know, they are a very 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 small minority and usually um <laughs> i don't have to feel too bad about them because by the time you get about halfway through their rant you're just like well not only are you obnoxious you're also hilariously ele elementarily level easily provably wrong um so I'm just going to ignore it. Um, but there, there is uh, sort of this thing that comes up quite a lot, which, for the for lack of a better term, I would I'm going to call min maxing. I know that's an RPG term, but and I'm not sure if it's entirely applicable. But the the general problem, as I see it, is where people go completely overboard one way or the other. You know, they either they latch onto something and they want to praise it to the you know to the highest heaven and say, no, this is the pinnacle. It is the uber thing. It is the invincible thing. It cannot be stopped. It cannot be questioned. It's better than everybody else's. Blah blah blah. And the flip side of people who are just like, oh no, this thing, whatever it was or whoever it was, etc., is the absolute worst. It's trash. It's useless. It's you know, it's not worth considering. It's anything they do is awful etc etc and that irritates me because for them presumably to have made that judgment they pre must have done at least some research into whatever it is they're disparaging or putting on a pedestal and if you manage to prize a few 
bits out of them as to why they think that, there's usually some kernel of truth in what they're saying, if that's the right term for it, um, or even if they are objectively wrong, there's at least an understandable logic to why, why they've come down to this conclusion. But then they've just taken it that one, two or three steps too far and suddenly become almost impossible to reason with. And that irritates me a lot because I'm looking at it and I'm going, if you just walked it back a fraction and was slightly more reasonable about it, then we'd be good. You know, you, and we could have a useful discussion. But when you go too far down the rabbit hole, it, it just becomes a bit of a waste of time. And I suppose the colliery to that is um, sometimes people who, in my opinion, unjustifiably accuse me of being, you know, having gone down that rabbit hole one way or the other. You know, I've had people say, oh, Drac hates to praise USS Constitution in any way, shape or form. It's like, no, I actually quite like USS Constitution, both from a historical perspective and as a museum ship. Um, and because I quite like it, that means I try to have a realistic view of it. It's a very well-designed, very powerful ship. Um, it's not invincible. Uh, it's not you know, it's not going to bounce every single cannonball, but it's still a very tough vessel. You know, and that, that uh, to me, is a reasonable and realistic view of it. But the minute you say, oh, well, she had the nickname Old Ironsides, but she wasn't stopping every single cannonball the British threw at her. People are like, oh, you hate the Constitution. It's like, oh, stop it. Stop being a child. Um, yeah, so basically... I think people who go to extremes and when they start voicing those extremes are the most irritating thing on the channel. Duke Master asks, Your thoughts on HMS Duke of Kent, its design, its practicality, how it might have fared in battle, and the authenticity of its design? Ah, uh, yes. The UK's answer to Santissima Trinidad, a purpose designed for Decker with 170 guns. Um... I mean, there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the design itself, um, which, you know, it, it's it's a big ship. It probably would have been a lot more manoeuvrable than uh, Santa Tissima Trinidad, largely on the grounds, as I said, that it was a purpose-designed vessel uh, for the for this kind of size and armament, as opposed to Santissima Trinidad, which was a pretty successful three-decker before they then basically added another deck to her, which didn't really help. Now, in terms of practicality, these big monster ships, you know, as maybe a flagship for the Navy, in which case it probably wouldn't have been called Duke of Kent, maybe as a prestige project, but 170 gun wooden ship of the line you can't build that many of them and you know something like 120 gun caledonia class is much more affordable and probably a better investment overall um despite it being you know it's basically duke of kent is kind of the early is the age of sail yamato to a caledonia or uh, Ocean class is Iowa. So, you know, there you go. How might I have heard in battle? Well, if it's at the core of a Royal Navy formation, it's probably just, it's basically going to act like Sovereign of the Seas did in the Anglo Dutch Wars, just sailing around casually, blasting away at things merrily, and then looking up to see what else has happened during the battle. Now, as far as the authenticity of the design goes, now that is something that has been argued about for. Uh, for quite a while now ostensibly the claim is that she was designed in 1809 um you know in the middle of the well towards the end i suppose of the napoleonic wars which means if she'd been adopted as a design maybe she could have seen service by you know 1820 or so which would have been interesting however um the questions that have been raised are that well you've got the ship's model as you can see here and you have a set of plans now the plans have been challenged quite a bit because they refer to sir william simmons who in 1809 was just an act an at sea officer in the navy um 
as well as ships that were laid down quite a bit later on and you probably can't see it quite so well from this angle but if you look at a picture of its stern it definitely shows influence of the round stern design of Simmons and Seppings who I've mentioned several times before but in 1809 were not in the positions that they would be in later on to introduce these changes. Now on the face of it that seems to be quite convincing evidence that this was made considerably later and then effectively retroactively dated to make the ship's designer look better. My only caveat to that is that the person in question, the designer, Joseph Tucker, did know Seppings before Seppings became Surveyor of the Navy. Um, indeed, actually, Tucker was Joint Surveyor along with Seppings uh, from 1813. Now, that means he probably had correspondence with Seppings, and Seppings was already thinking of his ideas, you know, well before he became surveyor. So the fact that the Duke of Kent model incorporates some variants on design elements that Seppings would introduce into the Navy, that in and of itself isn't, strictly speaking, a mark against it. It could just be a mark of you know tucker incorporating ideas that someone he knew had told him about the stuff on the drawings on the other hand the fact he mentioned simmons who you know there's no way really for that to be somewhat plausible i think um for 1809 as well as some of the ships that simmons would design later on in his career that to me does indicate that certainly the drawings post date the claim of 1809 as a date however it's not entirely unheard of for a ship to be designed in model form first and then papers to be drawn up later on so whilst i'd say there's probably a reasonable argument to be had that the ship was probably designed later on in the 19th century than 1809 it's still possible dash plausible that perhaps the model was designed and built around about 1809-1810, probably as a kind of an interesting thought exercise of, you know, look what we could build, almost like a, a wooden Tillman battleship, if you like, and then maybe, you know, as, as a flight of fancy and a proof of, well, hey, I can build a model, um, and then maybe later on the drawings were drawn up to try and flesh it out a little bit when perhaps it had never meant, been meant to be a completely serious proposal. Ty asks, given that the 700-ton sloop HMS Yara was designed to, with a crew of a maximum of around 160, and given the average weight of a World War II soldier was about 150 pounds, probably closer to 200 kitted out, how on earth did the Yara not sink or capsize after she rescued uh, 1,805 troops from the SS Empress of Asia? Well, luckily, the uh, Yara was a little bit heavier than that. Her standard displacement was just over a thousand tons, and being a sloop, um, a lot she had a lot of uh, d difference between standard and full load displacement. So her full load displacement was about fifteen hundred tons. So basically, she could com compared to standard, the fully loaded variant um, of Yara could handle about fifty percent more displacement then she she displaced at standard basically sorry that's a bit of a tongue twister anyway if you run the numbers on the troops that adds up to somewhere around 150 to 200 tons depending on which ton you're using and which figure um uh, which weight figure you use i mean that's a considerable amount don't get me wrong that's a huge amount for a uh, as ship of her size to take on however uh, bearing in mind that at the time that she um, took on all of those troops she had been sailing on convoy escort duty she ha was probably a little bit light so she'd probably used up some of her fuel some of her supplies etc etc so she wasn't running at full load so i suspect that she probably had the reserve displacement between what she, whatever she weighed at the time and her full load displacement which was still a safe displacement to take aboard all these troops 
Now, of course, where you put them is another matter. If you put all of those 1,800 troops on deck, well, I'd, A, I doubt they'd fit, um, but B, that could have led to the ship capsizing because, you know, on a ship that weighs somewhere probably in the ballpark of twelve to 1,300 tonnes at that point, um, yeah, 150 to 200 tonnes up top and she's going over. So to rescue the troops, they would have been taking the troops on and more than likely in these kind of mass mass rescue scenarios a lot of them are being checked over and immediately sent down as, as deep as you can into the ship because a it gets them out of the way so that other troops can come in and b the other handy thing is it means that the sh those troops are now acting as a slightly squishy ballast which keeps you nice and stable even as you sink lower and lower into the water so yeah i suspect that's how they did it the judge 2017 asks was HMS Hood the best ship in the interwar period? She seemed to be leagues ahead of the rest of the ships in that time period for their firepower, speed, and armour trifecta. Had other nations in the naval treaties pushed to be allowed to build a Hood-type ship? I suppose it depends by what metrics you want to judge the capabilities of the latest and greatest combat ships. Now, obviously Hood was very good looking and very fast, and the Royal Navy tended to use her as a flagship for those reasons. Um, she was very large as well, which isn't surprising considering that she was, by displacement, the largest warship in the world for pretty much the entirety of the interwar period. Um, but, you know, if you think about how she's rated, well, think about how she might stack up against the other nation ships. So the biggest and best that the Japanese have to offer is Nagato. So Hood is faster than Nagato. She has the same number of guns as Nagato. Okay, they're 15 inch as opposed to 16 inch. Um, but Nagato is less well protected than Hood. So that probably is a bit of a wash. At which point, yeah, Hood is probably marginally superior to Nagato. Um, thanks to the uh, Japanese decision to have her fairly thinly armoured. Then you look at, well, what's Nagato's equivalent in the in, in the Royal Navy? Well, it's Nelson. Well, Nelson has more guns, heavier guns, considerably heavier armour. She is slower, um, but in a straight-up fight, I'd probably bet on Nelson or Rodney over Hood. But. Hood doesn't have to be in that fight because she can just leave. Um, so, and then you look at the US with the Colorados, that being their latest and greatest at the time. And, well, at that point, I'll just defer to what the US Navy said when they had a look at Hood and evaluated her capabilities and basically said, yeah, she's pretty much equivalent to a Colorado under our rating system. So they thought she was probably about on a par with a Colorado. I think the Royal Navy would acknowledge that in a straight-up gunfight, Nelson would probably win, and Hood probably holds a slight margin over Nagato. So, you know, she's up there, but whether or not she's the best, I think probably comes down to how much value do you put in the fact that she's fast. If you don't put too much value in it, then something else is probably slightly better. If you put considerable value in her speed well then she's got the protection and firepower to be roughly on a par with a lot of other ships if of her time period so that would make her the best um in terms of had other nations in the naval treaties pushed to be allowed to build a hood type ship well the japanese really wanted to complete tosa but pretty much the uh, argument that everyone acknowledged at the treaty table was that if as long as you quietly ignored hood which was well over thirty-five thousand tons you could cap everything that everyone was either building or close to at least close to finishing at thirty-five thousand tons and just draw a line under everything there and then whereas you know whilst hood was large she wasn't a 16 inch ship which had you know psychological value and her design did obviously go a fair distance back by the time the uh treaty was being discussed her design was you know not quite but getting towards being a decade old if you go from the moment that she her she was conceived um rather than when she was launched and commissioned so 
everyone was very aware that if they pressed to have you know a mid 40,000 ton displacement ship of their own then everyone was going to want one at which point apart from being a national flagship there was precious little point because at that point what you're going to do the the US could have a Lexington class battle cruiser the British would go for a G3 and the Japanese would I think would probably go for an Amagi maybe they'd want Tulsa but yeah I don't know I think I think if if the uh, British are building a G3 and the Americans are building a Lexington they'd probably go for um, Amagi rather than Tosa but you know th they everyone realized that that would be a little bit silly so yeah there, there wasn't anyone as far as I'm aware was seriously pushing for we want a hood equivalent in terms of size Yokosuka girls marine high school training vessel Harakaze okay then asks I was reading the combined fleet website entry for Nagato and it mentions that at some point between the 20th and 30th of August 1945 she was moved from the dockside to the number one boy in the harbour on the orders of the just arrived Captain Sugino. You have to feel sorry for a captain who takes command only to hand the ship over a couple of days later. Accounts from the US Navy personnel that boarded her reported her boilers were lit, suggesting she made the movement under her own power, though other accounts suggest she was moved by tug. Do you know which version is correct and why she was moved from the dockside to the middle of the harbour? Was it for the sake of honour and to claim that she was captured at sea, or was it something else? Now, I don't know for sure exactly what was going on, but I suspect it was a case of they knew that Nagato was going to have to be surrendered, but there was more honour in a ship riding proudly at anchor in the bay surrendering than there would be for a ship that was basically tied up to a dockside surrendering um, so i think the movement was probably in large part for those purposes in terms of the uh, a boiler being reported lit while she was dockside she was supplied with partial power from a barge alongside and from the dock once she was out in the water she needed power from somewhere so having one or more boilers lit would be necessary just to keep basic systems like pumps and so forth functioning whether or not she made it from point a to point b under her own power i mean given how critically short japan was of fuel tugs or under her own power either way probably doesn't make too much odds i suspect probably tugs because um you know the, the time it would take for her to build up to full ste steam and then move a comparatively short distance and wind down again that would probably expend most of the fuel she had aboard which would be uh, a little bit embarrassing because she as i said would need that fuel in order to uh, keep herself under power while she sat at anchor salty viking 10,022 asks, what would have happened if the Royal Navy had attacked the Russian 2nd Pacific Squadron? Well, much as Admiral Beresford may have gone on and on and on and on about giving everybody a fair fight um, with you know a handful of ships, you know, chances are, given the size of the Russian formation, even if it wasn't exactly you know, that capable at that point, considering that a lot of the capabilities they demonstrated at Tsushima would be developed by training during the voyage, I rather think the Admiralty, if they had decided to attack the Pacific Second Pacific Squadron, would have done so with full force. Now, the question is, when would they do it? Because... In theory, you could argue maybe they should do it whilst the Russians are going down the channel in the immediate aftermath of the Dogger Bank incident. And indeed, the Royal Navy was mobilised in the aftermath of the Dogger Bank incident and shadowed the Russian fleet. So, you know, a pincer movement at that point by what was the home fleet and the channel squadron at the time, which, confusingly enough, the home fleet was in the immediate aftermath, not of the the incident but in 1905 because the second pacific squadron passed through in late 1904 anyway the home fleet was renamed to the channel fleet the channel fleet was renamed to the atlantic fleet so any but anyway at the time the forces available in the channel to confront the second pacific squadron 
as well as obviously cruisers and torpedo boats and destroyers and so forth, in terms of capital ships, would have been Majestic, Magnificent, Jupiter, Hannibal, Victorious, Caesar, and Illustrious. So uh, a full range of various pre-dreadnoughts, although technically outnumbered. Um, and then the the home fleet, as it was at the time, would have had Revenge, Empress of India, Resolution, Royal Sovereign, Royal Oak, Hood, Swiftshirt, Triumph, and Exmouth. So combining those two formations would have had a battle fleet considerably larger than the Sasak and Pacific Squadron. And given that the Royal Navy didn't have quite as many issues with you know training or competence as the Second Pacific Squadron did at the start of its voyage, it would have been a fairly one-sided and fairly nasty encounter, especially considering that, of course, being right on the UK's home doorstep, it could use all of its torpedo boats and destroyers and so on and so forth as pretty much the optimal scenario for them. The other potential scenario where that could have happened would have been if, let's say, while negotiations were going on, the Second Pacific Squadron clears the channel, but actually, instead of France historically restraining Britain from declaring war um, via diplomatic means, instead, this time Britain goes, you know, what stuff it, we're having a war, but by this point, the Second Pacific Squadron has left. Well, the other option to intercept would have been the Mediterranean fleet, as they, the, the Second Pacific Squadron heads down past the Straits of Gibraltar, and in that case, you would have had implacable, uh, formidable, bulwark, irresistible, vengeance, London, venerable, uh, Russell, um, Montague, Duncan, Albemarle, Prince of Wales, and Queen, which would have been the latest arrival. So, yeah, the Mediterranean fleet on its own probably has just as many battleships, etc., present as the combined forces of the home and channel fleets. So, yeah, e either way, um, I suspect a channel fight would have gone even worse for the Russians because they would have had less time to train and, they, as I said, they'd be at the Royal Navy's doorstep with all the fast attack craft being brought into play as well. The Mediterranean fleet, they would have had a little bit of a chance to get ready, um... Not that it would probably do them all that much good against the Mediterranean fleet, but they would have had that chance. And the Mediterranean fleet, whilst also obviously having cruisers and so forth, will probably have slightly fewer torpedo boats and destroyers it could bring to bear. And of course, you know, being prepared for it, even if even discounting additional training, just being prepared for the idea that you might be being attacked would probably stand the Russians in slightly better stead than if they're just immediately set upon when the the Channel fleet and the home fleet turn up on the horizon. Uh, but either way, the Second Pacific Squadron almost certainly would have been destroyed in, you know, pretty much Tsushima, but even worse, because at this point they're facing a, another competent fleet, bearing in mind the Japanese were built on the model of the Royal Navy, except the Royal Navy showing up with even more ships. Snowstalker36 asks, When Taffy 3 came under attack at the Battle of Samar, Obviously, the other carrier groups sent planes to aid them, but were there any surface units who theoretically could have made it to the fight? Yes, Admiral Lee's battleships probably could have made it if Halsey had released them earlier, even with them going off up north. And indeed, Lee, as I've covered before, was signalling, asking for permission to head back. So that's a theoretical unit. Um, the other unit um, that definitely could have got involved was Taffy 2's escorting destroyers because uh, taffy 2 the middle group actually did have its destroyers come under fire in the latter stages of the battle of samar and they were preparing to you know come in and assist but gambia bay and i think the other staff at the time ordered them at the last moment to fall back to protect taffy 2's carriers uh, because there were at that point it looked like the japanese were going to keep coming south so, um and Again, in theory, escorts for Taffy 1, all the way down down south, if they had turned on full speed and headed north as soon as the first reports of engagement were made, then potentially they could also have gotten involved. So the basically the escorting forces of all three task groups or task forces were in range to get involved at some point in the battle, plus your notion of these battleships, but the escorts were ordered to stay with their own carrier groups for obvious reasons because you know given the strength of forces that were coming down it didn't seem much sense at the time to you know combine all of the escorts into a, this mixed group of destroyers and destroyer escorts which on paper should have been swept aside by the japanese 
uh, task force and then leave all three task forces worth of carriers to be run down and hunted it made more sense for each of the forces to stay with their carriers to provide another delaying force to maximize the chances for the carriers to escape and of course as we said we know what why task force 34 notional as it might have been never made it back in time crack muppet asks gaming question have you played or do you intend to play the pc game battlefleet gothic armada 2 and are you familiar with or have you played the 1967 game jutland by avalon hill if so what is your general opinion of these titles at first glance or otherwise the answer is yes, I have actually played both. I haven't played the Jutland game for a long time. I think I played it about eight or nine years ago. Um, but, I mean, it was fun. Uh, but as a lot of people said, you know, if you want to refight the entirety of Jutland with the Jutland rule set, you, you will basically be there all day. Um, so it's it's fun to play individual engagements, but after a couple of hours, you kind of want to break. Now... With Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2, yes, I've played that. I've played Battlefleet Gothic Armada, and I, as you might have spotted in uh, one of the more recent videos taken in my library, I do still actually collect and play the original tabletop Battlefleet Gothic game as well. Uh, so Armada 2, I like it. Um, it's a pretty good representation, as was the original Armada game, of the tabletop game, except now on computers. Um, although I must admit... I do tend to do pause play uh, of a lot with it because it pretty much, as I said, is a real-time version of the board game, except you know, you're, you've got the entire fleet to go. And in the tabletop game, you make all your maneuver, firing, etc., command decisions on a ship-by-ship -ship basis. Whereas if you're trying to do that for everything all at once, especially once you have a large fleet in uh, the computer version, it can get a bit overwhelming to try and keep up with everything because you're having to direct pretty much everyone to do everything all at the same time. Um, so I just tend to treat it a lot of the time in larger engagements pretty much as if I'm playing the tabletop game. So I'll pause the game and I'll be like, right, this ship is going to do this. This ship is going to do this. This ship is going to do this then let it run through pretty much the equivalent of a turn length and they're like right and now i'm going to change everyone's order so pause and this ship does this this and this etc but it is very enjoyable simon me asks have you read emily o goldman's sunken treaties which places the washington treaty system in a political context more particularly, are you able to comment at all on her thesis that A, while the parties had converging political interests, such as the status of China, the treaty system worked, and B, when those interests diverged, the technical limitations, such as introduced in the London Treaty, failed to lessen tensions? John Jordan seems to go in a similar direction with warships after London when he writes about the London Treaty. This was a treaty with limited ambitions, doomed to irrelevance and failure as the co-signatories progressively chipped away at the edges. Now, I have read Warships After London. I haven't read Sunken Treaties, but um, broadly speaking, the two theses you describe, A and B, pretty much apply to almost any treaty system because a treaty system ultimately is an agreement between two powers that could, or more, that could ultimately otherwise go to war with each other to do something. Now, the reason they would agree to do that thing is either because they have interests that converge and it makes more sense to just agree to do it peacefully or they physically cannot afford to run the war that would otherwise resolve those issues and well or the arms race i guess now obviously the washington treaty everyone pretty much didn't want an arms race the u.s government had changed to a more insular one the british were trying to pay down their war debt and the japanese economy just physically wasn't large enough to keep up so yeah they it worked but when you got to the london treaty and i think this is kind of where both it appears sunken treaties converges with john jordan with warships after london and with my own assessment and i think they're, they're pretty much on we're all looking at things from the same perspective which is that i think the london treaty because it tried to further reduce things in a completely different political environment yeah, it, it, I think that's the core of why it failed, because at the Washington Treaty, everyone had set goals that were broadly speaking in accordance with each other, even if they disagreed on the details. 
By the time of the London Treaty, however, you had the US, which was broadly happy to keep going with what uh, what had uh, already happened, albeit you had the backdrop of the Great Depression. Um, you had the Japanese, who, of all the three powers, have probably been the least happy with the first treaty and were trying to expand a little bit um, beyond the treaty. But they could live with most of the limitations that were in that previous treaty, largely because they tried to rules lawyer around them. And then you had the British, who at the time were trying to get everything smaller and cheaper um, because, hey, British politicians, Britain, a country that carries on despite its government. Um, now, what that meant was you had the Japanese who'd really kind of see, like to see maybe a bit of a relaxation of the treaty limits. The British who wanted to drastically reduce the limit, uh, you know, reduce the size of everything. And the Americans who were kind of somewhere in the middle at which point it wasn't a huge surprise that the minute that treaty was signed, because people felt they kind of had to sign something, everything started to go a bit hay haywire, because the people who didn't want the treaty limits to be as stringent as they were would now start to find ways of going around them, and the people who wanted them to be more stringent would begrudgingly maybe think about building up to them. And it left everyone in a very unhappy place, which is never... A good place for a treaty system that's going to last any particularly long time so yeah um there were probably a few decent elements of the london treaty system which would be you know probably worth doing most of which concern closing loopholes so you know the mega destroyers the uh, sub-10,000 tonne carriers, things like that, that were obvious loopholes that maybe people hadn't thought about at the time. Closing those off was probably a good idea, but most of the other stuff that extended holiday construction holidays and you know, the split between heavy and light cruisers and so on and so forth, none of that was really necessary except as cost ambition, cost reduction ambitions, and a lot of those were pretty much the things that started to put in the cracks that the Second London Naval Treaty exposed as making the whole thing unworkable. Paul from Chicago asks, Can you briefly discuss the HMS Amphitrite mutiny and the Admiralty's response? And can you comment on if the Admiralty's response was particularly heavy-handed? So the Amphitrite mutiny is a bit of an anomaly in most Royal Navy mutinies of the last couple of hundred years. The vast majority of what you might call mutinies in the Royal Navy in that time period usually consist of one of two things. Either the ship is a reserve ship or otherwise has had very little to do and the crew are so bored out of their minds that it becomes, you know, in and of itself a little bit like being in solitary confinement. Um, and, well you know, work for idle hands and all of that, people start to address the uh, finer points of life. The other main cause of mutinies in Royal Navy service, which is often linked to ships being in reserve, is that the captains are frankly awful. Um, or some element of the officer corps is awful. And the reason those two are quite often linked is that usually the Royal Navy puts its best captains on the front lines and if you're captain of a reserve ship, you might be a perfectly fine officer, but there's a statistically higher chance you're probably going to be a bad one. Amphitrite is a little bit unique in that she was a very active vessel, which, you know, most active vessels in the Royal Navy don't tend to suffer mutinies. And when they, when they do, it's usually big due to something like working conditions. But in Amphitrite's case, the mutiny seems to have been, uh, certainly according to the Admiralty Court documents, almost if not entirely based around the fact that Captain Carver was possibly one of the worst captains in the past hundred years. And the crew hated him. He just, you know, he didn't do anything right. You know, he made everything, he made the work hours long, he made the, he, he left you know, their messes to get dirty all sorts of things. Um, 
And even even the food and the drink was served at irregular hours. So there was no no real schedule. Living conditions were awful and everyone was being worked double time. And the vast majority of the Admiralty Court documents basically said, yep, this is, this is pretty much it. You know, you had admirals writing letters just saying, yep, the captain is solely to blame for this whole problem, uh, which wasn't like a full ship mutiny. It was literally, you know, 50 odd people just refused to show up for work one morning. Um, and they, the Admiralty and the individual admirals were saying, yeah, the captain's entirely at fault. He's an awful officer. We should have got rid of him a long time ago. Um, and, well, to quote Admiral Colville, I submit to their lordships that he, that's Captain Carver, should be instantly relieved of his command and never employed again in any position when he, where he commands officers and men. If he's left any longer on, in this ship, there will probably be more serious trouble. So, you know, it was fairly clear cut. But, um, the, the problem that they faced was that, on the other hand, it was still an act of mutiny, so something needed to be done but on top of that it, it kind of had a, a confluence of events at the worst possible time there had been other justifiable mutinies about general conditions on the lower decks and concessions had been made to the sailors on those Al although this particular one wasn't related to those uh, there had been a number of other discipline related issues and of course at the time there was the uh, mutinies in the high seas fleet that were going on so the admiralty was concerned you know is this a pattern of further mutinies that are going to break out is this signs of socialist agitation what's going on you know something is up we don't like this we need to make an example and as a result whereas if this had been kind of a standalone incident it probably would have been dealt with much less severely you've also got to factor in the fact it it was wartime this this uh, mutiny is occurring during the first world war at which point they grabbed eight men out of the sort of 50 plus who refused to show up that day and six of them ended up being sentenced to two years of hard labor two of them to 18 months of hard labor with a secret clause that they weren't told about which would you know reduce their sentence by about half a year apiece um and that the sent another uh, formal clause that would suspend the sentences in after less than a year again, but they weren't going to be told about that ahead of time. And yeah, it was basically a reaction against external events rather than anything about the legitimacy of the mutiny itself. So yeah, it was uh, it was an unfortunate case. Uh, really, if they'd mutinied six months earlier or six months later, they probably actually. For even for exactly the same reasons, probably would have gotten far less of a punishment. Reva asks, how were World War II Royal Navy pilots and aircrew berthed? Did it vary widely from ship to ship? And what did they do to keep them busy on days that they didn't have scheduled flights? And was any of this notably different to how American and Japanese navies arranged matters themselves? It would vary quite widely depending on the ship type, because of course you would have... Uh, aircraft carriers where there were lots of pilots and you know purpose-built carriers which would have pilot accommodation purpose-built into specific parts of the ship you had the converted carriers which again they were designed for lots of pilots but the uh, exact location of the quarters might have been a little bit shoehorned in because of its conversion you'd have escort carriers where you know basically there was very little available space at all then you had merchant aircraft carriers where again even less space than an escort carrier then you had ships that had been built with the intention of launching aircraft like um, town class cruisers for example and king george v class battleships and then you had air um you you also then had ships that had been retrofitted to carry aircraft but hadn't actually been designed to carry aircraft in the first place and so you know, obviously a ship that's been designed to carry aircraft from the start is going to have a better laid out system of quarters for where your pilots and aircrew live as opposed to one that's been retrofitted. Um, probably the single best place if you want a nice relatively cushy environment is probably on something like a large sort of 1920s, 1930s cruiser or a King George V because they were designed to operate aircraft they were also designed to operate quite a number of aircraft but usually in world war ii if they carried them at all they carried very few of them so 
You know, for example, on a, a King George V, theoretically, you could carry four walrus, but they usually only had two. So you'd have, you know, twice as much space in the area set aside for pilots and aircrew, assuming, of course, that that hadn't been repurposed. Now, in terms of what you do to keep the pilots busy when they don't have scheduled flights, there is actually a quite shocking amount of stuff that you do when you're not actively in an aircraft. Um, so, for example, you might not be in the strike that, or the operation that's being flown, but there's usually a reserve aircraft, so you might, or two or four, which you might be sitting in waiting for a reserve call that might never come. You've also got your pre-flight preparations. You've got your post-flight debriefings. Um, you've got your general patrol. You've also got training, uh, which you'll need to do, paperwork that you'll need to fill out. Plus, of course, if you're operating with any kind of substantial air group, you, the pilot will also have a role within that air group itself. So they've got to keep their quarters clean and tidy, apart from anything else. But, you know, there's, there are various duties, um, not necessarily if you're a pilot helping with aircraft maintenance directly, because you may not be mechanically trained, but... You know, if um, you were flying along and your left aileron started fluttering, then you might spend time with the mechanics going, well, yep, I was at this speed and at this setting and at this altitude and I saw it do this and so on and so forth. Um, you know, there's actually quite, a, although you don't have shipboard duties, there's more than enough to take up your time in between, you know, meals and sleeping and so forth. And in terms of how this differed from the Japanese and American navies, this is a little bit of supposition on my part because I haven't come across direct comparison, but based on what I've read of accounts from all pilots from all three navies and how they operated, I get the general sense that um, as in most things naval related, the Japanese Navy was a lot more regimented, so you would have specific things set down and you did those, you didn't stray outside of them. And in the US Navy, I get kind of the feeling that there was a little bit more flexibility on the mechanics, maintenance and modification side of things. So whilst Royal Navy pilots could and often did ask the mechanics to change things around, you know, change the zero point of their guns or slightly modify the fuel fit mix of the engines or the type of ammunition they were carrying i come across it much more commonly and described in much more casual terms in u.s navy accounts of pilots actually you know getting down alongside the mechanics and making adjustments and tuning to their aircraft brandon minders asked can you talk about the shift of best aircraft carrier by year from 1920 to 1940 accounting for technical details such as aircraft but not including the experience of specific officers is there a shift or multiple shifts in the same year and can you talk about why i mean i can kind of talk about that but it is a little bit difficult because once you start taking into account aircraft everything just starts flying around all over the place if you want to talk about just the carriers themselves then starting off very early you're probably looking at something like hermes purely because she's basically along with hosha the only purpose-built carrier um and that's in the very early point yes you've got eagle and argus and so forth but you know hermes is actually designed for these operations then you get into the era of the conversions. So as the conversions start to come online, uh, Akagi, Kaga, Glorious, Furious, um, Courageous, Lexington and Saratoga, as I've mentioned several times before, the Lexingtons are by far the best of the conversions in terms of capabilities, and they're going to hold that place for quite a while because Ruggio doesn't you know, compare at all to the big carriers. Then you have... Ranger, which, you know, it's capable, but we all know what the US Navy thought of Ranger uh, when it came to do we risk air in combat in actual full-on combat operations. Then you get, as you come through into the early 30s, you have things like Hiryu and Soryu, which are pretty decent, um, but somewhat small, somewhat on the lighter side of things. <coughs> um, you also have Ark Royal, which is an interesting one. So I'd say in terms of pure, you know, 
anti-aircraft armament and aircraft operated per tonne and per square footage of deck space, Ark Royal is probably the best on paper carrier in the for, of the early 1930s designs, um, even though she can't operate um, an air group the size of Lexington or Saratoga, she again is a much, much smaller carrier. Um, and then in the mid to late 1930s, you have obviously the Yorktowns coming in, the Illustrious starting to be constructed, and at the tail end of things, Shikaku and Zuikaku, which kind of round off the experience. But, you know, by the end of the 1930s going into the 1940s, Shikaku and Zuikaku are probably the single most capable carriers, again, in terms of armament and aircraft carried per tonne and per square foot of, of flight deck and hangar space area of anybody. Um, but that's partly because they're just very large carriers. Now, the fact that they don't necessarily operate as many aircraft as they could and their operational efficiencies and stuff, this is where things start to vary because that's just your on-paper stuff for the carriers. Um, unfortunately, when it comes to taking into account aircraft, that's not really something I'm, I can answer with a dry dock answer. In fact, I, I, I think it would probably actually be a fair bit of compression to try and fit such a discussion into even a Wednesday video purely because aircraft come and go very quickly in this interwar period. And so, you know, various carriers are close enough that a change in a single type of aircraft, let alone a wholesale type set change in aircraft, could make a huge difference. And on top of that, there are some carriers that are somewhat more divorced from each other in capabilities that, again, could grab the top spot because they are temporarily equipped with an aircraft that's far superior to anybody else's. And you run into odd conundrums, like does the fact that in 1920 and 21 the Royal Navy is the only carrier operating fleet unit that has a torpedo bomber, does that make all Royal Navy carriers immediately superior to all other carriers, simply because they have torpedo bombers and the other navies don't? Um, or you look at something like the Ferry Flycatcher, which is you know really, really good for its time, and four years later is bottom of the league. You know, it would... I think it, it partly the, just the sheer speed of things and also partly the fact that it would require someone who is uh, a lot more au fait with the individual capabilities of ev of all these different aircraft would be required to answer that question in full if you're going to evaluate carriers by who is best based on air group, including all the aircraft performance characteristics. Blacksmith Panzer asks, I recently saw a video in which a naval vessel was hoisting up its anchor and was spraying the muck and mud off of it with what appeared to be power washers specially built into the hull. My question is, what is the history of anchor cleaning like? For how long was it just the most disliked midshipman being sent out with a brush and probably a pick for the barnacles? And also, how easy is it for a ship to replace its anchors? I imagine in the age of sail, a shipborne carpenter might be able to make some repairs, but were more modern anchors specially forged for the ships they were attached to? Well, part of the reason that anchors these days tend to need cleaning is because these days they tend to be stored partially or fully in board of the ship, and people don't like a lot of muck winding up inside the ship. Whereas in older ships, uh, you know, even into the late 19th century, as you can see here, anchors were pretty much stuck on the outside of the ship. So you can imagine, even if this anchor, these pair of anchors had come up really, really muddy, then if the ship's getting underway the sea spray would have cleaned off any residual muck and mud after not too long. Um, if it was absolutely appalling, then you might chuck a few buckets of water over it. But broadly speaking, cleaning an anchor in sort of much older ships isn't really going to be much of a thing unless the captain wants a particularly onerous punishment duty to give to somebody. Um, now, once you get into, I say, more modern ships where the anchors are being stored either aboard or recessed or whatever, and there's more of a chance that, you know, things are going to potentially muck up the interior of the ship, now you have to start worrying. And obviously you also have the fact that the anchor chain itself could get very muddy. But luckily this also tends to coincide with the fact that ships now start to become powered so although you might not have like a modern pressure washer type thing, you could have hoses set up either specifically or just, you know, at the time, uh, ad hoc, to wash down the anchor chains and the anchors as they came up. 
Um, in the latter part of the 19th century with the new ships when everyone's really obsessed with spick and span paint jobs, then you might have someone actually having to, you know, separately from the hoisting, actually have to go out and make sure everything was clean. But it's much, much more so these days with, let's say, the, the concentration to de attention to detail and the fact it's also with the, with both steel ships and modern electronics and everything, it's much more hazardous to have a bunch of seabed mud brought up that, you know, cleaning your anchors off completely becomes much, much more important. So there's not really a specific history that's more of just like spotty highlights of occasional reasons as to why or why you wouldn't or would clean an anchor unfortunately in terms of replacing the anchor um well worst well normally if you lose an anchor or two this is why you carry spares you know a ship will not normally be riding up three four five anchors but they usually carry something in that region of anchors specifically because you know you might lose one so normally if one of your anchors gets completely stuck you have to cut it loose or you lose it for some other reason you just use one of the others, one of the spares you have to hand. But if you've lost all of your anchors, then you... I mean, it depends how you've lost them. It's like, is, is the stock damaged? Well, a carpenter might be able to fabricate a wooden one. But if you've you know, done a Spanish Armada and had to cut your anchors loose completely, then you might have a few smaller reserve ones around, but they may not be enough. But you're not you're certainly not going to fabricate a brand new anchor there and then because well they tend to be made certainly for the bulk of the period the channel covers um going back in well into the edge of cell they tend to be made of iron or maybe occasionally bronze and you don't have the manufacturing facilities or the spare materials aboard to you know make a brand new one if you make it of wood it's probably going to float um, in theory, you might be able to, you know, completely bodge together one using some planks and some cannonballs to make it heavy enough to sink. But any kind of you know, bodged together, nailed, screwed and tied together anchor is not really going to withstand the forces of a ship dragging on it. You might be able to create some kind of, you know, sea anchor for stabilization or so forth. But in terms of a, you know, a, an anchor that's actually going to go and lock onto the, the seabed, you're pretty much out of luck at that point, hence hence all the spares. Um, modern anchors, generally speaking, they're not going to be forged, at least in for warships, they're not going to be forged specifically for that ship, but there will be a range of standard patterns of anchor for a navy, or sometimes even across multiple navies, which will be shared. So, you know, if you have, uh, let's say in, in the Second World War, you might have a standard pattern of destroyer anchor and whether you're a tribal a j class an n class or a z class you're probably going to be issued with a standard pattern at multi anchor because you're a destroyer of roughly within a given bracket uh, roughly a similar displacement whereas obviously battleships will probably share a different type of anchor but again it'll probably be a standard pattern the wind thief asks when doing research what process do you use to determine a source's credibility and also, what types of sources do you most enjoy reading? My favourite sources to read tend to be uh, one of two extremes. Either ones that are wholly or almost entirely made up of veterans' accounts. Um, I think that's partly influenced by, as I've mentioned before, my first serious naval book being the Imperial War Museum Book of the War at Sea by Julian Thompson, which pretty much is a series of veterans' accounts with a framework narrative around it. Um, but also, you'll tend to find that veterans' accounts, A, will be varied page to page. So you can read someone's account for two or three pages, read someone else's account, that account is going to be a very different style, so it doesn't get monotonous. But also, they tend to be a little bit more emotive than a standard writer. You then also have my other type of favourite book, which is the highly technical ones when you're going into extreme technical detail. And that's, I guess, the engineer part of me coming out. Um, other things can be you know, also equally interesting, but usually it's either very, very technical, very, very person-based, or I guess maybe a, on the third hand, um, and no, I'm not a Gene Sealer mutant, um, the, the, something that shows a lot of detail, even if it's not technical detail. So Marcus Faulkner's books, which basically tell both wars with maps, are really interesting.
because it's a different way of, te of, of telling a history. Now, in terms of determining a source's credibility, there are several different concurrent steps which I'll use as a kind of a, a standard thing to uh, determine a source's credibility. So first, well, actually, no, in no particular order would be who is the author? You know, is this author well regarded and well known generally? Um, is this author not known at all? Is this no author known for um, getting a lot of things wrong? Is this author known uh, for being controversial? Because controversial doesn't necessarily mean they're wrong. It just means there's a lot of arguments about the particular field that they happen to be working in. And, you know, that that may be because there's no one right answer. It may be because there is a right answer, but perhaps a lot of people don't like that right answer. Um, but it, it sets a scene. So who is the author? Um, now, of course, that also factors into other things like, you know, how many other books have they published before? Um, how well reviewed have those been, etc. So, you know, if if, for example, like recently, um, Norman Friedman recently released a book on uh, carrier aircraft. And, you know, he's written a lot of books about the US Navy. He's written a lot of books about um the British Navy. He's written a few books about other navies as well, um, battleships, cruisers, etc., and so forth. And you know, he's a very well-regarded and highly respected source. Now, obviously, no no book is or no author ever makes no mistakes at all. But you know, he's pretty up there. So if I'm if I see that come up for order, I'm like, right, okay, click. I'm ordering that pretty much out of hand. Same with someone like Bagne Bagnesco. Uh, apologies, Italians. I'm really terrible at getting that one right, um, and so forth. Beyond that, you've also got to consider what are the qualifications of the author. So D.K. Brown uh, is another good one. So he spent uh, most of his professional career working for the Royal Navy Constructors Department. So when he writes, um, you know, he, his most famous series, you know, Before the Ironclad, Warrior to Dreadnought, Grand Fleet. Nelson to Vanguard, and I think he did a few more for the modern era. So, you know, when he's talking in those books about, you know, the way that ships are built, how that how that works, how, what effects their damage had on future thoughts and how they were repaired, you know, you can pretty much, I think, rely on him to be pretty spot on. That is what he did for a job <laughs> the entire time. Um, whereas, you know, if if you had a passage in D.K. Brown's book which was giving a very strong personal opinion on an admiral um, and his command style, and not that there, I don't think there is such a thing in D.K. Brown's book, but let's say there was, then you would maybe, you wouldn't disregard it, but you would view that with a little bit more of a careful eye than something that the same book says about the construction of the torpedo defences on a Nelson-class battleship, for example, because, as I said, D.K. Brown was a naval constructor. He knows what he's talking about there. He doesn't necessarily have the same level of expertise when talking about personal command styles of admirals and apply that to all sorts of different authors. And then you get into the book itself. So if what kind of book is it? Is it a book that's designed to give a general history? Is it a book that's designed to go into specific, detailed um, claims that might require a lot of very detailed further research and if it's the latter you know what's the size of the bibliography what's the content of the bibliography do, the, do you recognize the works um, and reliability of the authors in those bibliographies and so on and so forth how much primary re resourcing are they referencing in those bibliographies as opposed to secondary or tertiary sources and then there's also how much does it gel with other known sources now this can be a little bit dangerous because of course if there is a common narrative that x happened and an author has discovered compelling evidence that in fact y happened if you just do a quick surface read you might go oh well this guy says this and everyone else says this so this guy must be wrong so you don't necessarily want to do that but um or, or apply too broad a brush but in more specific terms if an author is making a claim about something that is not just well known but well supported and you happen to know it and they're making a very different claim then you have to start viewing things with suspicion and start checking other claims that they've made as well so 
Um, you know, for example, uh, for the kind of thing I'm talking about, you know, if a book says, you know, uh, the, the Iowa class had 10 16 inch guns or um, HMS Vanguard was armed with 14 inch guns, we know that's not the case. Okay, in in the case of Vanguard, you can look at photos. In the case of the Iowas, you can physically go and look at them and see that the figure given in that book is wrong. Um, now, it could be a much more complicated thing than that, um, but fundamentally, the point is, if a book gets a number of things wrong that are very easily factually verified, and there isn't any real dispute to those, then anything else it says also has to be viewed with a significant degree of suspicion. Whereas if they're at least getting the basic facts right, that's a step towards trusting them on the more complex side of things. So this is just a, you know, a tithe of all the factors you have to consider when working out whether a source is credible or not. And that's before you start applying your own expertise, which again, of course, can be dangerous because there is always the risk of overreach. But for me personally, if somebody starts going on about detailed engineering of materials and set makes a claim about the capabilities of a particular metal or propellant or um, certain forms of hydrodynamics, I will apply my own knowledge to that and see, again, kind of a sense check is what they're saying um, at least reasonable or within the realms of practical possibilities. And if not, again, then you have to view things with suspicion. If it seems to line up with what you already professionally know, um, then that's a good thing to go with. But as I say, this can, that, that is probably the single most dangerous field of verification because A, you could be misremembering something from your own education. B, you could be overextending your own expertise. And C, you also have to be very brutally honest with yourself as to what exactly constitutes your expertise. Because... You know, I saw it once on a TV documentary is not expertise. <laughs> you know, I researched this and found strong evidence to support this. That is a degree of expertise. <laughs> so, yeah. Admiralty of Floof asks, From 1905 onwards, was there any period in time where the Germans outbuilt the English in capital ships or after 1925 where the Japanese outbuilt the US? For the Japanese, no, except for one possible argu uh, arguable short period, um, because, you know, after the carrier conversions, well, firstly, after 1925, you've got the carrier conversions, you've got Akagi Kaga, Lexington, Saratoga, okay, then you've got capital ship completion, well, Colorado's, Nagato's are pretty much all done by that point, um, so then, you know, capital ships, the U.S. builds North Carolina, South Dakotas, and Iowa's at the same time period. The Japanese are building Yamato and Musashi, so obviously not there. Um, but going back to aircraft carriers, you've got Ranger and Ruggio. Then you've got Hiryu, which is just fractionally before the Yorktowns. But then you, uh, you have Soryu, which is contemporaneous with the Yorktowns and the two Yorktowns being built. So kind of Ranger, Ruggio, Yorktown and Enterprise, Hiryu, Soryu, it's all kind of matching up together. Um, so really the, the only thing is there's a slight gap after Enterprise and before they lay down Hornet. And during that period, which is basically the latter part of the 1930s, then is when the U.S. is only building Wasp and the Japanese are building Shikaku and Zuikaku. So, yeah, the two Shikaku is definitely much more capable than Wasp on her own. But that's pretty much the only time period when the Japanese are outbuilding the U.S. in capital ships. And it's a very short window and specifically for carriers. Now, for the Germans, there is an identifiable two year period, really, which is 1907-1908 because the British obviously start off with Dreadnought, but as a number of authors have argued, they pretty much throw away the lead that they have opened, because obviously Dreadnought is laid down in 1905. Nassau, the first German Dreadnought, isn't laid down until 1907, but whereas the British have the opportunity to capitalise on Dreadnought's success with ships in 1906, 1907, 1908, in the end, only Bellerophon is laid down in 1906. Okay, doesn't make too much odds. The Germans weren't laying down anything in 1906, um, although she is right at the end of the year. But then in 1907, 
you get superb temeraire and again saint vincent like one day before the end so i suppose you could say bellerophon super the bellerophon class are kind of 1907 ish basically um which are three ships the germans get the four nassaus laid down in 1907 um, and then you go through 1908 and if you take the saint vincent which i said is 30th of december 1907 and lo lump that in then the british laid down the saint vincent's which again a three ship class in 1908 but the Germans build three of the four Helgelands in that time, so they're building at about the same rate, and obviously Oldenburg coming in just fractionally later. So, you know, there, there's a very, very small window where the Germans are outbuilding the British in battleships. And technically speaking, if you lump in battle cruisers, then 1908 goes over for the Germans as well, because in 1908 the Germans lay down von der Tann and Moltke, whereas the British don't lay down any battle cruisers. So, um, yeah. 1907-1908 is basically the two years that the Germans are outbuilding the British in overall capital ships. And finally, Matthew Jones asks, By 1945, what were the best radar sets in terms of power, range, resolution, accuracy, etc. for each type of radar, surface search, air search, and fire control? Now, fortunately or unfortunately, um, if you're talking about the very end of the war then you're basically talking about a two horse race between britain and america because well japan and italy started way behind in the first place and well germany had slightly better things to do in 1945 as opposed to you know developing new and exciting types of radar things like you know being invaded by the soviet union and being invaded by the western allies <laughs> a little distracting in any case um Broadly speaking, when you're looking at um, the, these things, you at least if you look at battleships, you tend to find, or, or carriers for that matter, you tend to find that there's a combination radar going for air and surface search, um, or at least what they some call air and surface warning radar, which is different to full scale search radar. But you know that's I mean, neither here nor there. So um, you have like you know, the SK radar used by the Americans in the very late late part of the war is purely an air search radar, has an exceptionally long range, but doesn't show up much on battleships. It shows up a lot on smaller vessels. Um, but because you have all these different radars of different sizes and capabilities designed for the different um, abilities of the different ships to support them, rather than go through everything, I thought I'd just do a few, quick comparison for your the closer range air surface search combination radar and the gunnery control radar. So for the US, um, the most common late war air surface search radar set is probably the SO-13 set. Um, so and for the UK, the sort of the similar one is going to be the Type Two Seven Seven. Now they both share uh, the same wavelength. They're both microwave radars with a ten centimeter wavelength. Um, the SO thirteen has a power output of up to two hundred kilowatts. The Type Two Seven Seven can go up to five hundred kilowatts. But the operational range against air <coughs> sorry against air targets is about the same, about thirty five nautical miles. But the Type 277 can, at least by the figures that I found, can go a little bit further against surface targets at 25 nautical miles versus SO13, which is rated at 16 nautical miles. But then you also run into the problem of how did each Navy quantify those figures. But broadly speaking, at least paper-wise, the 277 is fractionally more capable than SO13, um, but... You know, there are a lot of other operational factors. Type 277 didn't tend to have a brilliant rep, um, reputation. But there you go. Now, where it gets a lot more difficult is gunnery control radar, because for gunnery control radar, the latest ones you're looking at in UK service is Type 274. And I think, as far as I can tell, for the Americans on battleships, it's the Mark 13. Now, this is where things get really fun, because... The, the Mark 13 has a lower um, power, peak power output. Its um, power output is 50 kilowatts as opposed to the 400 kilowatts of the Type 274. Um, but 
strangely enough, despite having a lower power output, the Mark 13 can detect and lock onto gunnery targets out to 25 nautical miles, i.e. 46 kilometers, uh, roughly speaking, um, which is a lot of yards. Whereas Type 274 has a considerably shorter range at about 16 nautical miles. So you might th be thinking, okay, the um, the Type the Mark 13 is therefore the better radar, except for the um, you know the slightly lower power output, which will affect affect things like jamming or rough weather, etc. But then you get to range resolution. So the range resolution basically being you know can you can you distinguish separate targets how how exactly how close can things be before they merge into a single contact and the type 274 has the advantage there its range resolution is only 80 meters albeit at closer ranges whereas the mark 13's range resolution is 360 meters so the mark 13 despite having a slightly longer range is a little bit worse at working out exactly what it's looking at um, but the mark 13 can tell you exactly where whatever it is it's looking at is uh, much more precisely because its accuracy is five meters uh, as opposed to the 100 meter accuracy of the type 274 so <laughs> it's all swings and roundabouts basically the type 274 will get you a much more accurate idea of you know what you're looking at and will be able to blow through more jamming and weather conditions and so forth but the Mark 13 is a longer range and will be able to give you a more precise idea of exactly where what you're looking at is um, in terms of distance from the mount. So it's kind of a what do you want in a gunnery control radar would dictate as to which of the two radars you chose. Which, to be fair, given that, you know, given that Britain had a an early lead in radar but shared a lot of its technology with the US and both of countries were working on their radar systems continuously throughout the war the fact that it's actually a very close call between uh, the two parties for the best radars in 1945 isn't really that much of a surprise <laughs> and that brings us to the end of this week's dry dock thank you very much for listening everyone if you indeed you have reached the five hours and 22 minutes that the combined runtime for dry dock 223 is and uh, see you in another video